Ladies and gentlemen, Silent Mike, back with another video. We're in here. I hope you're doing well. Hope you're staying safe. Hope you're loving your loved ones. I hope your loved ones are doing okay. Uh, weird times for all of us. Hopefully we're taking care of each other and doing what's responsible. And I'm here, chilling at home. I've been chilling at home a lot. And uh, I'm going to try to create some content. I'm going to answer some questions for you guys. Go into detail what I got in my brain. <laughs> From Instagram, you guys left me a bunch of uh, questions. Thanks for all of that. Uh, Silent Michael 2 ks If you are feeling a little lonely, a little bit bored, I'm live streaming on Twitch basically every day. Building a community, having some fun, having discussions, whether it be fitness, business, life, joking. Um, so twitch.tv slash Silent Michael 2 ks or just go to Twitch and type in Silent Michael should pop up. Google Silent Mike Twitch, any of that should work. Hopefully I'll see you there. Um, I don't really have a schedule, but we've been going basically every day, almost all day. Uh, just hanging out, chilling. So, before, but before further ado, uh, hopping in the questions. Let's go. Why do people post videos even though they don't squat to depth? I've always been curious. Um, you mean on like on Instagram or something? I don't really know. You know, I think all of us. What? Why do people even post on Instagram to begin with? And I can only, you know guess or, or tell you my story. I started um, basically just as a way to post my progress back in the day. Um, I posted on Facebook a little bit. I started really powerlifting in like 2009, 2010. I got Instagram in 2010, 2011. And I remember around 2012 or 13, I woke up one morning, saw that there was a video feature and it was a deadlift day, a max effort. And I posted a heavy deadlift on that very Tuesday. Um, I, I remember it very specifically. I, I may have been the very first deadlift on Instagram. I'll stab my flag and claim that one. Um, and so then it just continued. Uh, I started to try to teach. I tried to st start to entertain there. Why do other people post on there? I don't really know. And why do people squat and maybe not squat to depth? Chances are they maybe don't know that they're not going to depth. Uh, or they're just a work in progress, as we all are. Not everything I've posted or everything I've done in the gym, content, business, Twitch, podcast, has been 100% correct or has been um, perfect. But... Um, I've either tried to improve upon that or I've tried to correct myself or learn further, grow further. So uh, let's not try to judge each other too hard. Uh, it never really helps, but just always trying to do better. Uh, thoughts on the ketogenic diet? Um, I feel like keto has kind of fallen out of um, mega popularity. It, it goes in peaks and valleys. It was really, really popular in around, again, 2011 or so. Um, there's a big push into it, kind of the paleo style diet. Um, and then now it seems there's an extreme of maybe tracking or what you want to call intuitive dieting uh, versus maybe carnivore diets. All these things are trends to me. Um, I think they're different tools, much like training, uh, bands, chains, variations. They're all tools that we should maybe learn about, know about, but ultimately you're gonna have to troubleshoot and find out what works best for you. Do I think the ketogenics diet is best for longevity? Um, no. Do I think ketogenics best for uh, most athletes? Probably not. Uh, do I think a ketogenic diet could be a Kickstarter and someone finding a way to um, better control their nutritional habits? Maybe, maybe. Uh, I think it's a step in maybe the right direction for many uh, who are used to eating absolute processed garbage day in and day out with no regard uh, for portion control, etc. cetera. Um, but how most people teach the ketogenic diet or what most articles or podcasts or things I see have no um, information on micronutrients, uh, macronutrients, or portion control. And I think that's the number one thing we have to focus on is, is general portion control, moderation, uh, and uh, getting in micronutrients, eating some wholer foods, some um, vitamins and minerals. Long story short, uh, it can help, but I don't think it's everything. How can I cut weight, uh, or how much can I cut weight before seeing a noticeable drop off in strength? Um, that's very dependent. It dependent on um, your general strength, your training age, your genetics, and then also uh, your size. Um, if you're 400 pounds, uh, you're gonna have a lot of mass that you can move in a squat. And so as soon as you start to lose some of that torso fat and general thickness, um, it will feel different for you and it'll feel worse. You'll have less Pushing for the cushion, as the kids say. So um, that might be a little bit more drastic rather than if you're 190 pounds, pretty elite power lifter, and you cut, um, you know, very precisely, um, you, you might be able to get to 180, 170, um, and maintain a lot of your strength when done correctly. Uh, it all kind of depends on the individual, but I do think people 
put it in their head that they're automatically going to lose a ton of strength. And uh, with proper programming um, and, a, and a nice dialed in cut, you could probably get away uh, with a decent cut and still, um, still uh, retain a lot of your muscle and strength over time if you allow yourself mentally to adjust to it. Um, best way to break a bench plateau uh, obviously depends on what you've been doing, uh, but typically the first things I look at are is your nutrition, um, whether you're in a slight calorie surplus, bare, at least eating maintenance, uh, and then benching frequency. Benching frequency, I still see a lot of people benching once a week or twice a week, uh, which is fine and you can progress that way, um, but upping just simply your frequency, even if it's a gimme day or a practice day and you're handling three sets of five, five sets of three, uh, 60, 70, 80%, on top of your normal programming, that can go a long way, and then you can slowly uh, shift that thing up in the volume and intensity phases. Um, are you doing any home workouts or are you just being a potato? Uh, I potatoed out hard. I potatoed out really hard for a week. I was eating frozen pizza and doing absolutely nothing. Um, but now I'm starting to move a little bit. So every morning I, I'm finding a new routine and that's probably the most frustrating part about all this is that I was in a good routine. Uh, I'll answer another question that has to do with that in a second. Um, but then, then you know, my routine kind of got took under us uh, as all of us did. So uh, now I'm waking up, getting my coffee in, I'm doing some push-ups, doing some air squats just to get some blood flowing and mentally move a little bit. Um, but I'm not doing extra hard uh, home workouts per se. It doesn't have to do with my goal and I don't enjoy them. So uh, I'm gonna be walking a little bit, doing some bicycling if the weather uh, is nice. It's been raining here a little bit, um, but generally moving. But if you guys are interested, like I said, just comment below uh, and I'll try to get that for you. How do you go about finding a coach? Do you think someone needs to have a certain amount of time with the bar before they get to one on one? Um, I'd probably say no. I think no. I think um, I think different coaches have different skills, but a lot of the best coaches can coach anyone from a beginner um, to an uh, to an elite athlete. And I think anytime you're getting a coach, you're going to accelerate your progress. You're going to accelerate your knowledge. You're going to accelerate your learning. So um, what might take a beginner on their own from go uh, from whatever. Uh, what it might take a beginner um, a year uh, alone, it might take a beginner with a coach only six months, whether that again is knowledge, strength, or physique changes. And that, and that same thing goes to an elite level world champion. Um, what, what, what might take a champion a year to do, it might take uh, a champion with a coach nine months to do, or 10 months, 11 months. That gap will change a little bit, but yeah. Are you single? I am, I am. All I do is play video games, cook ground turkey and create content for you. So I stay at home a lot. I am single, married to the game. I think Tupac or someone said, married to the game. Why doesn't she like me? I don't know, buddy. I don't know, little buddy. I, I wish I knew, but I don't know why she doesn't like you. I'm sorry. Stop leaning forward in the squat or kind of tilting forward or getting in forward of yourself or hip shooting up early. Shout out to my boy Rob for the question. Uh, Slack out, right? And everyone says that, but what does that mean? That means full tension in your arms, right? Think of these things as ropes and we want no slack in that thing, uh, no slack in our entire system. So you wanna feel a little bit of a, a pull or, or tightness in the hamstrings and glutes before you begin to pull. Shoulders directly over the bar, momentum going backwards and proper hip height. Pulling evenly, uh, think about kind of pulling with your traps and leading with your chest and pushing with your legs. Uh, another thing people do is they tend to just push with their legs and not kind of pulling on the bar as well. Um, that will allow you to hopefully uh, do that. A lot of video game questions on here. Shout out to all my gamers out there. Again, we're on Twitch. Uh, .tv slash Silent Mike. Come hang there. Um, I play on play PlayStation 4, a lot of Warzone, Call of Duty right now. But we play a variety of games, have some fun. Mostly just chatting with you guys, building the community. Advice on low back pain for squats and deadlifts. I tried upping the volume and lowering the weight, but still wrecks me. Uh, this is a big thing, obviously a very hot topic on the internet. Um, people talking about back pain, whether it's how much of it's psychological, how much you, uh, of it is physical and the actual science behind pain. And again, I'm no doctor. Uh, this isn't necessarily my specialty, but I do listen, read, watch a lot of uh, professionals. And I also have a lot of experience myself with not only back pain, but working with athletes uh, and kind of number one starts with, there's two things in my head that pop up to start. One, I think a lot of people, and I tweeted this jokingly, uh, just at one buddy and people got very offended, but I was just joking. Um, don't take everything I say on the internet so serious, fam. We're trying to have a good time out here. But a lot of people didn't play, um, whether it's elite or very competitive sports. Now sports hurt, 
um, sports you can get beat up. I remember playing basketball, you know, for 15 plus years, 365 a day, uh, 365 days a year, um, and you wake up feeling beat up. Even as a, a kid, I'm 15 years old, in great condition. I'm lifting weights. I'm in, you know, arguably one of my primes. You're very malleable at that age. It's hard to get hurt. Um, but every day after basketball practice or a game, you wake up and oh man, this calf's pretty sore. Man. That dude really elbowed me in the ribs last night. I'm pretty beat up or dang, my legs are really gassed today. Um, some of it is just pain uh, and some of it's just being hurt, right? As soon as you start to warm up and the adrenaline starts going to the next practice, the next game that I had three hours later, uh, all of that went away. So um, knowing that powerlifting is a sport, it is difficult. You are adding a lot of stimulus to your body. There's gonna be some uncomfort. Uh, two, the number two thing that comes to mind um, is just that the big difference between pain, being hurt, and injury. Um, and again, I'm no doctor, I can't dig, dive deep into the science as a lot of you guys may want. I don't know why you want that, I'm not that interested in it. Um, in, you know, The big definition to me is injury is you need a doctor to fix it. I need to go see a doctor. My arm is broken, this thing will not get better physically or not hurt until I put this cast on it or take these meds, et cetera, et cetera, or need surgery, right? Rather than just being hurt or beat up, there's ways I can find um, to mitigate the pain, adjust my training, adjust my lifestyle to help them. And the number one with back pain for me, um, in terms of your exact question, uh, I wouldn't add volume actually. Uh, you know, I, There's a certain amount of volume anybody can take, um, but then we obviously have to adjust on our personal experience and what our personal bodies can take. But typically, intensity is gonna hurt your body a little bit less in my opinion um, than adding more volume. So I would keep the weight you know, moderate to high and take away a little bit of volume would be my first adjustment. My, uh, I guess my second adjustment in programming. First adjustment would be just to warm up. And I understand the stronger you get and the more you're into powerlifting, your training sessions become two, three hours long and you wanna get through these things. And so we go from doing a nice warm up, moving around, getting a sweat going, taking the barbell for a couple sets of 10, adding a plate, adding a plate, to skipping all that and literally just hopping on the bench with a plate because you wanna get through it, get your three sets of five at 315 on. But what I would suggest is really taking that 10 to 25, maybe even 30 minutes to actually warm up. Um, there's a lot of things that coaches and PE coaches back in the day got wrong. There's a lot of things they got right. And one of the things they got right is simply moving. Um, my, my bigger suggestion to that is not only take that 30 minutes before to get a sweat going, get moving, do some lunges, walking, jump rope, um, assault bike, bicycling, whatever it might be. But I would do that before and after the session in general. So whether you wake up and start moving around, doing some lunges, uh, just going for a walk in the morning, going for a walk at night, riding your bicycle. I'm lucky enough to live in a metropolitan area. Um, and so I, I, for multiple reasons, but this being number one, has helped my back and my training volume in general, uh, allowing me to handle more loads and more volume is biking and walking more. Uh, loosens up your back, loosens up your legs, gets the blood flowing. Um, and a lot of the uh, kind of static style movements that we do with our feet planted and back really rigid will tighten up your, your, your low back. It'll tighten up your lumbar and all uh, torso muscles involved. Um, those will loosen up when you start to move your hips and walk in stride and loosening those up oftentimes will take away a lot of pain for a lot of, a lot of us. Again, I'm no doctor. You, if you're injured, by all means, go to a doctor, do what you think is best, seek professional help. Um, but if we're just hurt and in pain, walking, proper sleep, proper nutrition, proper hydration, and just warming up properly, I think will help most of those issues. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that's it for this one. New video every Monday. All the support, the likes, the comments help so much. Check out 50% Facts every Wednesday on all podcast platforms. Silent Mike twitch.tv live every single day. Come chill. Hope to see you guys there. I'm out of here.